We're in Titus, and this is lesson number five. And so let's just uh, go to the Lord in prayer and get started. Father, we just really pray for any of uh, the other women that are stuck downstairs because of the elevator that they'll come on up the stairs. And we just really thank you for this time together. We ask that you would teach us um, the things that we need to know and to glean from this, this really rich book of the Bible that, that you left for us to study. And so, Lord Jesus, we thank you for who you are and for all that you do in our lives. In Jesus' name. So, today, we'll, let's do a little bit of review. Uh, we're in the book of Titus. Titus. Who wrote the book of Titus? Paul. 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 Okay, who did he write it to? Titus. Titus, okay. <laughs> it, was, it was a, it's called something because it was to one person. What was it called? A letter, but <laughs> something else. <laughs> Who said that? that? Pastoral epistle. Uh, yeah, because because it's just to one person. We're privy to their interaction together. Uh, where does it take place? Creek. Creek. And, and the creepy creeks. <laughs> the creepy creeks. And how how was Titus there? How did he get to Crete? With Paul. Yeah. <laughs> we went with Paul. We went with Paul, and Paul did what? He left him there. He left him there. For what purpose? To uh, organize a church and appoint elders and, and get rid of the false. I mean, he had a big job. Put things in order. Put things in order. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It was a mess, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, this week when I was studying, and I don't know why, I, I hadn't even thought about this, but <laughs> y'all have. <laughs> These were. This was a fairly new work, maybe one to two years old. The work is was you know, and so there really weren't any really older Christians here. We're, he's giving all these instructions, and they're we're going to get the best of the best that we can get. I mean, you know, because there probably weren't any Christians. Maybe they were older in age, but ne not necessarily in maturity. Right. Um, and so he was going to have a, his job cut out for him because he was going to need to teach them the things that they needed to know um, uh, and, and that kind of thing. And so uh, it was quite a work that he was called to uh, and trust entrusted with. Um, he was younger. We don't know how young, uh, younger than Paul. But, um, but anyway, and so he calls him his dear son in the faith. And why did he call him that? Why did, most people think he called him that, my dear son, my true son, in the faith. That he led him to the Lord and he discipled him. So uh, he was a true son in the faith. And and so now that he's been left there, and Paul's writing him a letter, he's been there working on getting the church organized, different churches, going from church to church, I guess, in these different, they said villages or little towns or whatever, all over all over the uh, that area, and making sure everything was done decently and in order, decently and in order. And that's one thing that has really helped me. Uh, it helped me with my parenting. It's helped me in my walk with the Lord that, that God is a God of order. He is not a God of chaos. And he has directed us specifically how we should live, and it's to be done decently and in order. If you're in a situation with a church service and it's chaotic and all that, I, I don't stay. I, I, it, my spirit just goes, Whoa, I don't know how to talk, but, but anyway, you know, so we want that it would be done decently and in order. Is He's a God of order. We see this from the very beginning. We talked about that from the beginning of time when he created man. Um, and it was, it, he didn't do it hodgepodge. He didn't say, well, let's put some trees out here and Oh, well, the trees are going to need water. Uh-oh. I mean, <laughs> that kind of thing. So, um, anyway, but but it, that's where we are. He's given instructions, clear instructions about these, what these elders are supposed to be like. I think the thing that sta stands out the most is blameless. Um, there are a lot of other things that he talks about, but he keeps saying blameless, right? Blameless, blameless. Um, and so, is there nothing that somebody can point their finger at in your life that's not uh, that you've not dealt with. Now it's not saying that there's not things that you've had to deal with, but you've dealt with it. And so there's no finger pointing uh, or dishonor to the church. And so 
uh, Paul, Paul talks about that he is what kind of a servant is he? Bond servant. What is a bond servant? Bond slave, bond servant. What is that? What's different from just being a slave, being a bond servant? The commitment is different. Okay, the commitment's different than what? Oh, you said it. He chooses to. It's a choice. Oh, it's a choice. Uh, you, uh, Jesus Christ came to set us free. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, and now we're going to uh, Romans twelve. We're going to present ourselves to Him, to him as a bond servant. Mm -hmm. Who gets to make the decisions in your life? Your master. Your master. You follow the master. You represent another, and so that's that's what we've that's what we've gleaned so far. Has anybody got anything else that we not just kind of touched on that we've already taught? That's maybe you've learned through this Bible study, even in your own study, or is or are, are we pretty much up to snuff? <laughs> yeah, uh, up to speed. Okay. I I want to say something. Okay. I was listening to a commentary and it was saying that Zeus, you know, they really the Greek gods and everything were real big, and they claimed that Zeus was actually born in 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 Crete, Crete. and um, of course he was a god, so born but um <laughs> but that he was it was a lot of licentiousness and oh, seduction yes. and we're gonna talk about that today. yeah we're getting to that yeah oh man but this so, place is not a good place yeah this 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 place is not a good place so we're we're almost through with chapter one <laughs> and so so we will finish it up today no matter what no if, even if you have to stay here all day. i'm just kidding uh but but anyway um and he, we're going to start in um, well, in 9, he is told that these men are supposed to be able to teach the Word, both encourage and to teach people, but also to correct them. So we're, we've been told that in, in, in verse 9, that that's part of it. They're supposed to uh, challenge the false teachers. And evidently, there were a lot of false teachers here in here in Crete. It says, um, in verse 10, it says, For... For there are many rebellious, empty talkers, deceivers, windbags. <laughs> mm -hmm. A windbag. Well, a windbag that's just it has an opinion on every subject and thinks they're an expert on everyone and not on any. If you've ever been around somebody like that, that they just feel if there's a moment to feel, they fill it with nonsense and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. Um, and so uh, nothing spiritual about it, but but they're rebellious. They're rebellious. And and so um, he's doing a very difficult job here. This is not in any way, in any way, an easy job. It's, he's doing a very difficult job. Um, and we've talked a little bit, why was help needed? These are new churches. These are new converts. It's only one to two years that these churches have been in existence. And so uh, one of the commentaries that, that uh, or a uh, teacher that I listen to that I've really come to enjoy. But um, anyway, he said that these people were really a problem, really encourages me as a pastor. <laughs> I said, what? And he said, from the beginning of the church, there have been problem people in the church. Uh, and so, we're you know, from the, because we're sinners, that's right. And then, and then there's also the fact that, that a lot of people, and we're going to see that these people may not even be, most likely are not even saved, that uh, I remember in the 80s that Billy Graham said, or 70s, I think it was, <laughs> Billy Graham said that he believed that 80% of the people sitting in the pews of the church were lost. That's big. What is it today? You know, and so they've come into the church. They've come into the church uh, to be a part of the church, and so they're problem people. Um, they're insubordinate. Some translations say insubordinate. Just, that's a bigger word than just rebellious. I mean, they're just, um, they're rebellious, but they're, uh, uh, they will not, they refuse to submit to God or any other authority. They refuse to submit to God or any other authority. I remember early on in my boys' um, um, career, uh, they were young men. I, but somebody that's insubordinate, they refuse to yield to authority. Refuse to yield to authority. Uh, and so we don't want to do that. And they don't want to submit to God, but they don't want to submit to any kind of authority. 
any kind of authority. And so that's these people that he's talking about. But that, but we can recognize them because they're rebellious and empty talkers and deceivers, deceivers, um, and especially those of the circumcision. Uh, now, what that meant was there were some people in this town that were Jews and had become believers, uh, and they were argumentative as well and being being rebellious. There were those that said that if you were a wanting to be a Christian, you had to first uh, be a Jew. In, in other words, you had to convert to Judaism before you could convert to Christianity. And uh, they discussed this and they earlier on in the scriptures, and this is not true. They were even saying that you needed to be circumcised, the men needed to be circumcised, and all of those things going on in that situation of saying if that is uh, the case. And so he says, especially those uh, of the circumcision. And if you can imagine, um, I, I love talking to Rich, poor guy. Uh, in Israel for, oh, my, I don't even know how many years, a long time. And he's moved here. He married a gal that lives here, and he's moved here right around the corner so we get to spend a lot more time together. He's just a, such a dear. And I love to talk about him, to him about his conversion. It's really it's really interesting. Uh, he said, we Jew, a Jewish conversion is so much different than, than a Gentile conversion. He said, we had, he said, for me, it was steps. You know, it was just really steps. The first step he took was 12 years old. And, um, uh, he went to, a, and this is wild, a Catholic priest and a Jewish rabbi were best friends in his, in, where he lived in New Jersey. And, and they, they decided it would be great if they brought all the teenagers together and they talked to him about Catholicism and they talked to him about Judaism so that they could understand each other better. And so this, this, um, this uh, priest said to him, that uh, to, to the kids, not just to him, but to everybody, Jesus was a Jew. He said, what? Jesus was a Jew? He said, how can that be? So he began to look it up and begin to read a little bit. And so he found out that Jesus indeed was a Jew. That was, that was, a, that was, a, revel, that was a revelation to him. That was that first step for him. So if Jesus was a Jew, if he was one of my own people, you know, wait a minute here. Um, but he was in his late 20s when he actually came to Christ. And there were other steps where God brought people into his life. So the first step was he had to discover that Jesus was a Jew. And then he had to discover that Jesus claimed to be Messiah. Then he had to go research that mm -hmm. and discover that Jesus was Messiah. Mm -hmm. But he still had not accepted him as his Messiah. And so it was a process for him. And he said, uh, so many Jewish... People think they have to leave their Judaism in order to become a Christian. And he said, I found that it just enhances everything I already knew. I'm not leaving any of that behind. I'm not this, uh, saying that the Old Testament is not for real. But, but Jesus, Jesus has appeared and he was Messiah and he is Messiah. And you have to accept him as your own Messiah. So that process for them. So these Judaizers... You know, I mean, they were being argumentative, maybe. I mean, maybe it was a tough thing for them to say, oh, wait a minute, we thought we were the only chosen ones, right? We're the chosen people of God. And so you're saying we're not? You're saying all these Gentiles can have access to God? Wait a minute, they can't even come into our synagogue. And here you're saying, so So this was probably a difficult thing for them. So there was a lot of... Um, talk, <laughs> empty talk going around. And, and and evidently there are books of Jewish fables. I never knew that till the, yesterday. There are books of Jewish fables, just stories like we would have, I don't know, bedtime stories or whatever, but they're not, they're not necessarily true. They're just made up stories, but they accepted them as true. Some of the Jews accepted them as truth as much as they accepted you know the the old, the old testament they believed that those were, those were true um and so that was another thing that they were probably 
being argumentative about. So he's saying, especially, especially we're having trouble with these folks, uh, you know, and, and, you know, Paul's a Jew, but, but it was a, it was a very difficult thing. And so, you know, on their behalf, I mean, maybe it was a very difficult thing for them to, to, to work through what, what was, what was what. So, so anyway, so the, the, these were, there were problem people that they were having to deal with that, that, um, Titus was having to deal with. And we still have that today, do we not? I mean, you know, I mean, some of the things that churches split over. I don't know, some of you are from different places in the United States. I'm, I'm you know, from the South. We've lived in Texas, we've lived in Alabama, now in Tennessee. Finally the best place. Finally the best place. <laughs> and the, 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 thing, the thing is this, some of the things that churches split over are absolutely ridiculous. What color will the carpet be? I beg your pardon. Uh, you know, and so you would have churches sometimes in the South. I, you have, you'll have churches, and two miles down the road you got another church, and you know, two miles down the road you got another church, and you you start talking to these people, and they said, yeah, we all went to this church, but then a part of us split off and went to that church, and part of us split off and went to that church. I said, well, you say was it a doctrinal issue? Oh no, no, no. <laughs> no, not anything is, you know, as bad as that. Oh no, we all believe the same thing doctrinally. We didn't like the way things were done in da 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 da, da. and they decided they would, and that we didn't like the things that. Same things happening here. The same thing is happening in this. If you've got these people that are pro a problem in the church, a problem in the church, and so so we need these good. He's been there, but they're subordinate. They're rebellious. Uh, they don't want to submit to God, and they don't want to submit to any authority at all. They want to be their own authority, uh, and God has a set order of authority in this world. He has a set order of authority for the home. He has a set order of authority for the church. He has a set, set a way of authority in our workplace, in our communities, in our government. All of that is in Scripture, and he wants everything done decently and in order. Decently and in order. I mean, the home, the authority that God has set up in the home is, is one of the most um, <laughs> argued things in the church today. That, that God would say a man is the head of the home? I beg your pardon. Uh, that's a place of responsibility that God ordained for him to be the head of the home. Now, I realize there's a lot of men not doing a good job, but that doesn't change God's line of authority. And and there's a lot of men that, that don't do it right, that are not loving their wives the way they're supposed to be loving their wives. And then the wife comes under him and the children come under the, the two of them. And we're supposed to submit to one another. Uh all of that, all of that is his way of ordering things for us. And he said it. We didn't say it. Read the scriptures. Read what it says. Does it mean that the woman is less than? No. She has a different position. She has a different position. She is the heartbeat of the home. Ladies, you are the heartbeat of the home. You know, some. I heard somebody say this one time. You know, the heart, the head, the man is the head of the home, and the woman is the is the head of the home, and the wife is the wife is the heart of the home. But the head can't function if the heart's not pumping. And we have the privilege of setting the tenor of our homes. The scripture says, "A foolish woman," in Proverbs, "a foolish woman tears down her own house with her own hands." You ever met a woman like that? I have. I have. She is absolutely destroying her husband. She's destroying her children. And, the, and that home is not functioning the way it's supposed to be. And she's also destroying herself, ultimately. But a foolish woman, we don't want to be foolish women, right? So God has a way of ordering things. And that's what he's even saying about here in the church. Okay, Titus. We got to have, this is the way it's going to be done. This is the way that God has instructed me, Paul saying that, 
has instructed me to teach you to, to teach to go in now and find these men. I want you to then you're you're to teach these men what they're supposed to be doing and they're supposed to be uh, running the head of the church, the head of the churches. And so that is uh, that's very important. Uh, and he also remember not only does he tell us to submit to those in authority over us. He also tells all of us to submit, submit to one another. We're supposed to be submitting to one another. Uh, I had the privilege of talking on a, a little uh, Zoom meeting yesterday with some gals and, and uh, uh, you know, submitting to one another is very important as we begin to talk about that process of being submissive. And, and I, I told them that in our home, we had this rule. The best idea wins. Not the person. The best idea wins. And so our children could have a voice. They could, ask, if we told them to do something and they didn't agree, they could ask to speak. They'd say, "May I speak, please?" Uh, my sons changed that in his household, and they say, "May I ask a question, please?" Uh, and they could give their opinion as long as they were respectful and submissive. But if they crossed over that line, they had to hush, and that was it, and, and it was done. But but as long as they were, and we would listen to their opinion, and maybe they had some insights that we didn't have about this situation. Uh, we would listen intently. We gave them a voice, and we would listen to them. And then at the end of the time where we had talked about it, we would either make a decision one way or the other. Our first original command holds. Or we didn't know that, and because we didn't know it, and we know it now, we're changing our mind. Uh, it's, boy, that's being submissive to one another. Uh, they use that on their movie set. I remember Sean Astin, who's the king of improv. You don't know Sean. He, he really is. And, and, uh, and, and so he said, I've never been on a movie set like this before. Uh, you know, and Andy says, what we do on the movie set is John's labored over this script forever, and we take it and we do it just by the script the first time, and then we do it about three times, and we say, just do whatever you want to do, <laughs> whatever you feel led to do. It's improv, you know, maybe it's going to be turn out better, and so a lot of what is in Mom's Not Out is total improv. Uh, it was funnier than what was on the paper. Uh, but the and he but he said that my opinion mattered to the director. Submissive to one another. Now, at the end of the day, who got to make the final decision? The director. Who got to make the final decision with our children? The mom and dad. But we're we're listening. We're giving people a voice in our lives. Do you allow other people to speak into your life? Are you so defensive? First of all, they're terrified to open their mouth because they you know, they know you're going to bite their head off, or you're going to deny that what they're saying is truth. You're not going to really listen. So when someone comes to you with something, you listen. You submit to them and you listen to them. Now, who makes the final decision? You do. Maybe what they're saying is not something that you agree with. But you give them the opportunity to, to, to have a voice. And you listen to what they're saying. You truly take it to heart. That's being submissive to one another. And that's what God wants. That's what, what he wants for his body. You know who I've learned more from in the last 20 years, 19 years? My daughter-in-law. Mm -hmm. I love, they'll call me for advice before it's all over and we've talked and talked for hours and hours. <laughs> and we come to the, a conclusion and I go away refreshed and instructed myself. For my own. Are you teaching? Are you stiff-necked, insubordinate? And so we're to be, we're to be not stiff-necked. We're supposed to be listening and being taught more and more and more and more and more. 
as we grow more in the Lord Jesus Christ. So these people were not doing that. And so, uh, and so he says uh, in verse 11, who must be silenced? <clears throat> That's pretty direct. Mm -hmm. he, did, he didn't say, just be under, just be tolerant. You know, tolerance is not in Scripture. Just be tolerant with these people. You know, just, just be merciful to them. Just let them talk. They're not going to cause a problem. So they're in error. It's not a big deal. Now, caution here. If you're not part of the problem or solution, keep your mouth shut. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you're not part of the problem or the solution, keep your mouth shut. But if you are and someone's in error, you tell them the truth. One of some of the best advice my son, one of my sons was ever given, he and another little friend, they went went to my Bible teacher because they were having some things that they didn't agree with that were going on in the youth group and they wanted to know how to handle it. And so they told her what was going on and she said, Well, that's great. Um, and it's good to know what you're what you're don't what you're against. That's great. But what are you for? Mm -hmm. What are you for? Uh, you know, so, but these people have to be, they're to be silenced. By who, who's he talking to? Everybody, everybody in Greek? Who's he talking to? No, who's he talking to? No, who's he talking to? Oh, to Titus. Titus. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> he's saying, he's saying, he's saying, Titus, you've been, you've been commissioned to take care of the church, to to set up order in the church, and I'm telling you, this is the biggest problem you've got, son. They have to be silenced. And who's got to do it? Titus. 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 I am not con confrontational. I don't like confrontation, but I've learned to love it. If not for my, but to, for, I'd do better if somebody's confronting me than I've got to confront somebody else. I'm with you, Sheila. I, I, like I hate confrontation. But I remember on one occasion um, that there was something going on in our church, and uh, I was part of the problem, not part of the problem, I was part of the solution for this situation. And my husband said, you have to go talk to them. I went, beg your pardon? <laughs> uh, and it was a pride issue. It was really a pride issue. And, and I said, uh, you're going with me, right? And he said, no, you're going by yourself. And I went, I don't think so. He said, my, my children are sitting here listening. He said, yes, sweetheart, you are. And I said, okay. <laughs> uh, so my eldest son took me where I needed to go that day because, because he needed the car. And, and he left me for about an hour with this person. Terrified. Mm. I was terrified. Because I didn't know what reaction I was going to get. When we brought up the thing of pride, this person scoffed at me. And said to me, prideful? But I did it. Whatever God did with it, evidently it, it was good because this person's not walking in pride anymore. I know that for a fact. <laughs> and I don't know if it was me or it was a hundred other people that told this person the same thing. I don't know. But at the same time, he was told, okay, Titus, here's the problem. Here's the answer. Silence them. So I think it's important that we prayerfully go first before the Lord and make sure we have removed the plank out of our own eye before we go. So yes. That we go right. there with gentleness and respect and we mm -hmm. see the love of Christ mm -hmm. in us mm -hmm. as opposed to we're coming into a fear of God. Yes, and the thing is, why do we go to people? Why? Why? There's only one reason that you draw ever go in, to Christ. huh? To draw them closer to Christ. To, to, to restore them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To draw them closer to Christ. To re mm -hmm. restoration is the thing. And until you get to the point that that's the reason you're going, don't go. Amen. Uh, if you're go if you're going to just because you want to have a say, you think this person's an idiot, and you want to let them know it. 
uh, you got the, all the wrong motives. So motive is important. That's why I'm saying we have to check our own hearts. Absolutely, Candace. We have to check our own heart. And our motive has got to be for their sake, not for yours. Because you care about them for their sake. For their sakes. But the answer is, in this situation, Titus, they need to be silenced. You cannot allow this to continue. Why? Why could we not allow this to continue? Can you think of any reasons? It's like yeast. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. Get bigger mm -hmm. and bigger mm -hmm. and bigger and bigger. If somebody doesn't do something about it, it's not going to stop, is it? No. Okay, it's not going to stop. And so, so... This situation with these people that are going around, we're going to see what they're doing in a minute. But, um, but anyway, it says, uh, who must be silenced because they are upsetting whole families. They were going into these, maybe that, maybe they got um, to be friends with one of the kids or, or the husband or the wife or Whatever, and then they were going in with all this false teaching mm -hmm. into these homes and instructing them in incorrect doctrine. Mm -hmm. And so you've got these people going in here into the homes, into whole families, and it says, says teaching things they should not be teaching mm -hmm. for the sake of sordid gain. Mm -hmm. The reason that their motive. Okay, Paul is saying, I want to tell you what the motive is of these people. It's money. It could be money, but it could also be prestige. Mm -hmm. you, know? Uh, you know, remember when Paul said some preach uh, for lots of different reasons. Mm -hmm. Remember? Mm -hmm. and, and some of it was pride. Uh, and so it could be for pride's sake. They go in and they, they want to get an audience and pull people in their their motives are crooked or actually financial gain they're gonna go in and start charging or go in and whatever they're gonna do but their their hearts are corrupt their behavior was in the verse before us their behavior came out of the heart and the, the scripture says out of the heart but it's the Heart, the, mouth the mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So these people are are going into these homes and they're upsetting families. So let's just get it like that. I mean, you know, maybe, um, maybe they come in with a false teaching and they convince one of the members of the family about this. And the family brings this person in to tell all the rest of the family. And maybe... Two out of the five or whatever agree with this false teacher. And then maybe the other two are more grounded in the scripture. and They say, no, this is incorrect. So then you've got families that are, are divided and can be easily destroyed. And so he said, you've got to protect your people, Titus. I would not want to be a pastor. I mean, I'm a girl, I can't be a pastor. But I, I would not want to be a pastor. I, 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 do you pray for your pastor? Every day. At, just at the foot of the cross. I mean, even when our pastor is preaching, I am like, oh, Father God, protect him from himself, first of all. Uh, protect him from all those that would come against him. Keep him strong in the Word of God. You know, undergird him, teach him, because it's tough being a pastor nowadays. Can you imagine standing in the pulpit? Our precious little pastor back in Birmingham, it used to say, it's so difficult to stand in the pulpit and know all those stories and preach accurately and not give in to trying to be more tender because they're in the congregation. Mm -hmm. It's hard. And every manner of sin, it's not even hidden anymore. Uh, and so so he's, he's saying, Titus, I, you know, Paul was kind of tough. Titus, first of all, what did he say? I'm, I left you there. <laughs> 
I said, you got to stay. I let you there. I don't know if he was totally by himself. I don't know if anybody stayed with him. We don't know any of those details. But I left you there for a reason. And now I'm going to tell you what you, the next step is, and that's to do the elders. I know, and I, this is not in the letter. This is just me, uh, you know. Uh, I, I've left you there to to um, pick out elders. I realize nobody's older than two years old in the faith, but find the most mature guy you can find. We've got to have elders. Then you've got to teach these elders the truth. Uh, now, then, while you're teaching that, I want to tell you what else is going on behind your back. You've got people that are doing all manner of things behind the scenes and maybe not so behind the scenes and they're going into your congregation's families and they are disrupting them. They have to be silenced. And guess who's in charge? You are, Titus. Wow. He must have also had a lot of confidence in Titus. Mm -hmm. uh, that he would do the right, that, that he would do the right thing. Uh, that he would be Gentle, even as we've said, and loving, but go in and talk to them. And we know in Matthew 18, we're told the procedure, right? Uh, you, you can go and study that on your own in that chapter 18 where, you know, you go by yourself. Nobody listens. You take somebody with you. They don't listen. Then you take it to the, to the church, um, and then they deal with it. And so it, we're not going to just go and slam them. We're going to go and do it correctly. Uh, he was a man of God. And so who's going to do it correctly? But it had to be done. It had to be done. And nowadays, if somebody stands up for the truth, people get upset with them in the church. You know? Uh, and so he had a job, he had a job to do. And then he says, you know, these people are creeps. <laughs> Remember that, Titus. Uh, that's that's in, in verse twelve. He says that their creeds are one of the one of their very own prophets, one of themselves, one of their very own prophets uh, of their very own. Said creeds are always liars. Yeah. Now I had somebody. I read. I, I was listening to somebody and said, "Now if you thought about this, if creeds are always liars, maybe this creep was lying about them being liars." <laughs> <laughs> I said, we won't go there. <laughs> but anyway, but Paul says, Cretes are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This was a place of lasciviousness. This was a place of, of immorality. This place was horrible. And the gospel had penetrated. People had been saved. Uh, but, but these are the people that he's working with. I don't know if you've ever done too much discipleship. I had one one of my gals that I've discipled for many, 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 many years, uh, probably 25 or 30, uh, called me the other day, and she's got two new gals that she's mentoring. <laughs> and she says, oh, my goodness, you know, one of these girls is such a mess. We're undone. I mean, we are unt uh, uh, untangling knot after knot after knot after knot of just junk. And, and, and she said, oh, it's just every week it seems like it's worse of the things that she's been involved in in the past. And we're having to get freedom over them. She's, she said she's being transformed, but boy, it's tough. That's what, as he's going in and he's saying, remember, Titus, these are people. He's, he's got to go in and say, what you are saying is heresy. Right. What you're saying is error. We will not be teaching it in our church. And if you want to stay in our church, you can't teach it either. There's nothing that. wrong with that. Yeah. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, um, yeah, the truth will set you free or cause you to run away. <laughs> and so we we're hoping it would set them free. But, yeah. but it's for restoration. But he said, this has got to stop, is what, what Paul said. We cannot allow this to continue in the church. These, this is false teaching. The reason is we're going to try to restore these people, but neither can we allow them either to continue to teach falsely. Uh, I, re I remember we were having, I was, um, at, when we first came to our church there in Mount Laurel, and there, there was a gal that was um, uh, teaching a Bible study, and I went a couple of times, and she was not teaching the doctrine of the church I attended, 
Uh, you know, and so um, uh, another gal and I began to pray about it, and we, we left. The, we didn't go to the Bible study anymore. And then um, our the, pa I had, the pastor pulled me aside one day and said, uh, I, uh, would you be willing to co-teach with this woman? And I said, I can't, sweetie. And he said, why? I said, because she's in error. And he said, uh, is it really, is she really that bad in error? He's not been in the Bible study, I guess, but, but anyway, I said, oh yes, just come for a minute. I told him some of the things she'd said the day I was there. And he went, whoa. Well, it wasn't long after that, they went to her and said, you cannot teach this in this church anymore. You cannot teach this in our church. This is, uh, this is against our doctrinal statement. This is right here is what we believe and this is what you're teaching. And they do not coincide. In, you cannot do this anymore. Oh, uh, you cannot teach this anymore. She refused to change. Mm -hmm. So they said, well, then you cannot teach in our church anymore. She left the church. Now, that's what, that's what could happen here. Right. But nevertheless, it's got to stop. Right. One way or the other, it's got to stop. We cannot allow those that teach error to be teaching in our church. All the years, this is wild, all the years that I've taught, over 50 years, uh, you know, um, there were, uh, a church there in Birmingham uh, had asked me to come and uh, teach at the church. Uh, and it wasn't necessarily that we would have been on the exact same page for some things with doctrine, most things. Uh, but the pastor asked to see what I was teaching. Uh, and, and I said, gladly, and I gave him my notes and all that kind of stuff. And, and, um, one of the girls that had asked me to come teach, she was mortified. And she said, oh, Sheila, I am so sorry. And I said, sorry, he's protecting his flock, sweetie. Mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with that. He's protecting his flock, but that's the only pastor that ever did that with me. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so, but that's what he's saying. We, it, 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 it's, it's, it's got to stop. Okay, it's got to stop one way or the other, and we and and, uh, and so it says, um, and then in, thir in thirteen, this testimony is true. This is absolutely the truth. Cretans are liars. They are immoral. All of these things are true. For this re for this reason, reprove them severely. Um, you know. I used to teach parenting classes. I used to have girls that would come over and help. I would teach them. And we would have times where I would teach them how to discipline their children. And we would walk through situations together. And, and you know, and I would always say, don't ever discipline your child in anger. If you're angry, go get yourself together before you say anything. Now, some of these gals, then we had to overcorrect because then they were like, now, sweetie, you shouldn't be doing that. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> that doesn't mean that you're not going to say this is unacceptable you do it again and this is the consequences do you understand me tell me what I just said uh, you know and give it back to me sternness is not severe not necessary severity and sternness is not necessarily sin if you're doing it in anger yes yes it can be but this is not that necessarily. But it but it says uh, it says reprove them severely so that they may be sound in the faith. Your goal is that they be sound in doctrine. Your goal is that they believe the truth. Your goal is for them to walk in newness of life. It's not to beat somebody up and make sure that they believe the way you do so you'll be more comfortable. It's not about your comfort. It's about them. It's about them and them being reproved and drawn and drawn in. But they don't always heed the reproof. They won't always heed the reproof. It, it, it would be wonderful if they did, I remember a young woman that had been coming to me week after week after week. I'd led her to the Lord. Um, she'd come from a pretty, pretty tough background. And one day we were sitting out under the, in the swing in my backyard, and she was not doing great. And I said, sweetie, can I tell you something? She said, yeah. And I said, every week when you come, you come with a toy box. 
It's tightly locked. You've never dealt with one of those toys in that box. Not one of them. Not truly. And if you don't, you're going to be restored, re destroyed. It was three weeks later that I got a call from her frantic husband. She had left with another man. Y'all, you can reprove, but they have to decide. You can't decide for them. But your goal, your goal is that they be restored. Your goal is that they go on in the faith. That's your goal. But but even if they don't, it still it still can't go on. In other words, you know, you're not going to let them stay and be teaching this error. You're not going to allow that if you're in charge. And, T and Titus was very, very, very much um, in um, in charge. The culture uh, had all probably permeated the church, even as we have in our day, right? Uh, the culture, and so they're they're trying to purify the church, and so this is things that. Um, have to be done uh, and it says not paying attention to Jewish myths and that's what we talked about these fables that the Jewish people told uh, and commandments of men who turn away from the truth even in the law they had made laws so that they wouldn't break the law and law, law you know I, I know Anna I don't know if y'all know Anna she's a she's a completed Jew and uh, and she said, the thing that really began to get me and to turn me toward Christianity was when I found out there were not 10 laws that I had to obey. There were 600 and something. And she said, that's impossible. And then she began to investigate Christianity. Uh, she began to investigate. So these are man-made rules or, or rules that that are not necessarily in Scripture, that men are trying to hold over people's heads. Uh, and and even the thing of the circumcision, that could be one of the things that, that they could be talking about. Things that are not necessarily what the Scripture says that we have to do. And so he, he is saying, um, he, he is the, and it says, in commandments of men who turn away from the truth, they're not necessarily standing by the truth, there are three things that are not to be taught in the church. One is false doctrine. The other one is insubordinate, insubordinate things. And then unprofitable things. Unprofitable things would be the myths. So those three things are not to be taught in our churches. False doctrine, insubordinate things, rebellious things are not to be taught. And unprofitable, unprofitable things. Um... And so, uh, which would reprove them so that they can be restored. Uh, and so then he, then he goes on to say this. To the pure, all things are pure. What's that mean? All things are pure? Uh, those things that were permitted, these people were calling evil. We're gonna, the, the next part of the verse is going to tell us about that. Uh, they were even saying marriage was evil. Uh, they were they were saying you know all things are evil. But but he says to the pure, those who really have the heart of, heart of God, all these things are pure. Uh, you know it's not even recreational things they were saying were impure. Uh, they they were just saying everything because it because then it's it says but to those who are defiled, unbelieving, okay. <laughs> Nothing is pure. Uh, everything, that they're defiled already and they're unbelieving, so everything that they touch is, not, is, uh, is defiled. Uh, they're defiled by every, everything um, that's defiled and unbelieving. Nothing, nothing is pure, but, but both their mind and their conscience are defiled. What does that speak to today? Y'all, we live in a day where they call... Good, evil, and evil. There you go, Candace. Good, evil, and evil, good. Mm -hmm. There's no standard. There's, there's no, no standard. Truth. No truth. There's no, they say there's no truth. There's, 
you know, they're, they're, why? Why are their minds have been corrupted? I never for, will forget Bob Riley. He was our governor when we were, he was a senator. And Bob, one day we were all sitting around talking. He said, you know, when I ran for Congress, he was a congressman first. He said, when I ran for congressman, he was just a little farmer and, and, and you know, and, and owned a car dealership. He was a very wealthy man. But, <laughs> but, but anyway, he, he said, when I ran for Congress, I ran because I just knew that they were ignorant in Washington. I just knew they were. And if I went to Washington and I told them the truth, I could change their mind. He said, y'all, it was such a revelation. They know both sides. They know the truth. But their minds are so corrupted they can't see the truth for what the truth is. They do it because they want to because their their minds are defiled. That's what this says. And they're gained. A filthy game, game. yes, uh, yes, and well, and power. Oh, you can. I don't know how many of you have ever been to Washington. Uh, you know, I, I remember the first time I went to Washington, I almost hyperventilated uh, because there really is Potomac fever. There really is. It's just this. Whoo, <laughs> you know, I mean, the whole world is run from this spot. I mean, it. It was just such an awareness of this. It was just weird. Uh, but anyway, and they get up there and they, the power goes to their heads. They're not very, very careful and know what they really, really believe. But it said, he says, their mind and their conscience is defiled. You know, people are not doing bad things necessarily because they know it to be wrong and they're doing it anyway. They believe it's right. Right. They believe they believe it's right because they haven't been transformed by the word. Well, they they have so defiled themselves in their lives. They've they've done you know you don't necessarily. Um, I, I remember um, some of the kids in our neighborhood. The boys got into the early early teens, especially Andy was in his early teens, and some of the guys had been uh, caught drinking beer. Down, not my guys, guys down the street. They were friends with these boys, and and I said. Uh, Hey, fellas, if they ask you to have a beer, will you be tempted? No. I said, well, how about if they just said, you know, your mother and daddy are really weird. They don't let you do nothing. Are you okay with that? Would you be tempted with that? He said, maybe. And I said, if you yield to that, guess what? Won't be long that you'll be doing this. Uh, and so it's that same thing. They didn't start out in deviant sin. They did. They didn't start out there. Probably they started with a little, little more giving into more sin and more sin. And they are of their father, the, the you know devil. I mean that we all were, uh, you know, and a little more sin and a little more sin and a little more sin until it completely takes over their whole mind and their conscience is seared. That you know, it's completely, completely seared, and so that's why he's he's saying he's saying that to us. They're conscious; they are they are defiled. And listen to this: they profess to know God. Now, this doesn't mean that they it's a it's a big G, but it doesn't just mean that they profess to know Yahweh. Uh, it it could be their own form of God, correct? I mean, how about the New Age movement? I mean, we've got all kinds of gods. We've got all kinds of different gods. But they they profess to know God, but maybe they're professing to know God. Jesus, maybe even. Uh, they're professing, but, they, but their deeds, but by their deeds, they deny him. Now, y'all, we're told, to, you know, there's wheat and tares that are in, in there together, correct? We're not supposed to try to figure out which is the wheat, which is the tares. Uh, but because we would, we could destroy the wheat in the meantime, right? That's right. what he says. I'll take care of that. You don't worry about it. I've got it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but at the same time, as we're walking through life, because he's talking about these people that he's been talking about from verse 10 on that Titus has got to deal with. And he's saying, Titus, I want to tell you something. They pretend to know God or, or they say they know him, but their deeds by them, they deny him. 
watch their deeds. They don't live according to the Word of God. They don't embrace the Word of God. They live another lifestyle. They're those people that come to church on Sunday morning and Monday through Saturday night do whatever they want to do. And so that's what he's saying. Being detestable, diso disobedient, and worthless for any good deed. Wow. One of our characteristics of being human is we want to matter, right? That's what put God's put that in us, right? We 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 want to we want to matter. They don't they don't matter at all. That should break your heart for those that you come in contact with. But he's saying there are gonna be those. There are going to be those in your church. And, you know, they're going to wiggle their way into leadership sometimes. But he's, he's telling Titus, I'm telling you, son, this has got to go. You can't let this go on. But now remember, if you're not part of the problem solution, what are you supposed to do? Inquire. And, and do what else? Pray. Pray. Yeah. Pray. Pray for restoration, and, and, for and repentance. Absolute repentance. They've got to repent if they're going to change. They've got to repent. And repent means to turn around, right? Completely. And so as we are dealing with people, we can glean from this. This was to Titus. He's been told to find these men that are godly and to, to rule over. But he says, but watch out, Titus, doing this while you're doing it. I'm going to tell you what you're going to be up, coming up against. And I'm going to tell you what to do. And this is what you need to do. And you need to do it so they would be restored. But if they're not restored, then they're useless. You can't allow it. You can't allow it. Uh, two takeaways and we'll close. One is for your own life. You know, make sure that we're not empty-headed fools. Uh, you know... Uh, but that we're living according to the Word of God. But if God brings people into our heart lives and into our sphere of operation that we need to, to help to learn to walk through situations, to do it gently and in love. But, but, um, but then the second takeaway is that I don't know what church you go to. I don't know if you have deacons or elders or a board. Some churches have a board of directors. Uh, whatever that is, you've got a teaching pastor, maybe two or three teaching pastors. I don't know. Pray like crazy. Pray like crazy. First of all, I remember when my husband first went down to legislature. And I, I would stay home. And he would go down three days a week down to the Capitol. And I'd say, how can I pray, baby? He'd say that I'll recognize the truth. Because so many people lie here. I don't know who's telling me the truth. Even my own people. So first of all, you need to pray for your pastors and your leadership that they would recognize the truth. That they would recognize these people. That God would bring these people that they, they can look on and say, hey, wait a minute, this is not honoring to God and we can't continue to do this as a church body. That God would give them boldness and love. I hope you all went home and read your doctrinal statement of your church because next week we're going to be talking about doctrine some more. If you've not done it, if there's not one on your website, a doctrinal statement, go to your pastor or somebody in your church, church section here. She runs church after all. But anyway, and ask them for a copy of the doctrinal statement of your church. Don't just read it, study it. Don't just read it, study it. Do you agree with it? If you don't, you know, maybe you need to be somewhere else and, and read it. Read it before next week. That's your homework. Get the doctrinal statement and read the doctrinal statement. And study it. Look at it. What does it say? What does it mean? Do you agree? Okay? All right, let's close, let's close in prayer. Oh, Father God, we do pray for some of those that are sick and didn't make it today. And uh, we just really do pray that you would uh, heal them quickly, bring them back to us. And then, 
Lord Jesus, we just really thank you uh, for your grace and your mercy uh, over us. And we just really do pray that you would cause us to be ever mindful to pray for our pastors and our leadership in our church, for wisdom, for insight, for boldness. And so, Lord, we just really do pray that you would do all things decently and in order in our lives, in our family's lives, and in our church's lives. And we want to thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.